All right, good afternoon. Um, there are three handouts. The next homework assignment is due on next Friday, uh, February 20th, right? It's on the web page. I forgot to write it again on the on the stuff. So we have uh, this week and next week. Um, I'll, there won't be a class on Friday. I'm going to be out of town to uh, NSF, so I couldn't get somebody else to cover the class. So you'll have a day off. So um, use it for a homework assignment or project, right? Um, so we left off with, with the, you know, we're talking about MPEG, MPEG-1, stuff like that, right? So are there any questions about what we covered so far? I hope you get a sense of, you know, how, what, what multimedia is, because we can't talk about doing stuff with multimedia if you don't get a sense of um, how complex or how easy or, or, or uh, stuff like that, because we're going to use, you know, any system that you want to build has to use these, these factors, right? Um, and it's not always clear that people, so if you see, you'll, in, if you look at papers, there are a lot of papers which don't even consider all these stuff, and they, they talk about, let's drop some frames kind of stuff. And um, hopefully after this rather long intro, you get a sense of what, what is possible with the I, B, and P frame. Far too often you'll see people talk about, oh, let, you know, just let's get some saving by dropping iframe, right? Um, what will happen if you drop iframe? If you purposefully drop iframe, what do you expect would happen? Yeah. You lose that frame and all the others that depend on it. Yeah, you lose, you lose all the others that depend on it, right? Um, does that mean that you lose the whole string of stuff after that, right? So you, you this is what sort of you expect, right? You expect i and certain combination of p and b, right? And then next i, right? So what do you expect that you would lose? Like, like you said, all the things that depend on it, right? So what, what would those be? Roughly, it, it's potentially everything up to the next side, except if you have b frames, they could depend on. They could depend on some things that may save you, but in general, you lose a whole bunch of stuff, right? Um, and those, 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 though the observation is iframes tend to be large, so if you drop them, um, but the practicality is if you drop i, you may also drop the whole thing. Um, if somebody says, we'll, let's, let's do, I mean, we are running out of something, let's drop B frames, right? What do you expect such a system to be? So if I drop a B frame, would that ruin your, how much effect would that have on how the video looks to you? Yeah. Uh, it wouldn't be as Yeah, so you lose a little bit, right? But would you do that? Would you want to drop the B frame? Forget about the, so it's, it doesn't have much impact, right? So is that something that you would want to really drop? Remember the compression ratios that we were talking about last lecture, right? I frames, you get about one is to seven, P frame about one is to 20, and B frame one is to 50, right? That means this frame is, pretty small compared to iframe and all those things, right? So if you drop the B frame, you probably won't notice it, but you're not gonna get gain that much in terms of whatever you're trying to do, right? So if, you're, if your goal is to save bandwidth, and if you drop a B frame, you probably won't notice as bad, but you're not gonna save as much either. So um, it's not a linear relationship where you drop one frame, you get equal amount of stuff. You you lose a B you lose a B frame, you lose very little amount of you get, you get very little amount of saving, right? So it's not as trivial as dropping uh, stuff, um, and that's one of the reasons why we're looking at all the stuff. So we we were looking at MPEG one, which is not which is pretty much not used anymore. Um, the, the 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 commercially viable uh, product from MPEG one was the VCDs, which. I don't think it ever took off in the uh, in the U.S. and I'm not sure what's the state in in, in Asia either. Where it, where it used to be popular, right? DVD medium is cheap enough that that's that's pretty much the the, the standard now. And MPEG-2 is used not only on DVD but also many of the cable systems, except the newer ones which tend to go for MPEG-4, right? 
So this being a newer standard, this being used for stored medium, so they could afford to have higher bandwidth, right? Four megabits per second um, translates to a lot more data, so you, you need the DVD to complement the stuff, right? So you can show up to four megabits per second. All these standards, again, are only decoding standards, not encoding standards. So even, if, even though you say it's MPEG-2 encoded video, all you're trying to do is make sure that somebody, somebody else can decode it, right? So for commercial advantage, they don't specify how you should compress it. All they say is how the objects should be laid out so somebody can read it, right? And you'll find that many of the things that we're gonna talk about, especially in the next one, MPEG-4, MPEG-4 supports a lot of nice modes. I'm not sure how many of them actually can be used in real life, right? Because it's, it's, it's fairly complex, and so the, the authoring tools have to catch up with what they're trying to do. Um, and even, even some of the stuff we talked about, you know, in terms of slicing and stuff, you need some kind of way to specify what is important, what is not important, all those things, and the, those go back to the, the slicing tools, right? Um, so in MPEG-4, um, they, they defend a number of different profiles. Essentially, those are ways to say what exactly you want to talk about. So rather than saying, um, rather than saying that you, you, you want, uh, um, like, 4 is to 2 is to 2 chroma subsampling, uh, it's part of a profile, so you can say, um, this is how I'm going to encode it, so can the decoder uh, do that, right? This comes, comes into play because if you have, like, something, example, iPhone, or iPod, or something, right? They, they deal with, say, MPEG-4, right? But the, the real catch is they don't deal with all forms of MPEG-4. They, they, for example, deal with some, you know, some profile, and that's a way for you to say, even though you're supposed to do play MPEG-2, what is the exact uh, stuff that the, the player and the decoder can do? Because depending on the, um, the higher profiles require a lot more resources, which may not be possible for a particular player, right? So in, in terms of DVD, they restrict the amount of stuff that MPEG-2 can do. So DVD player plays MPEG-2, but it cannot play all the MPEG-2, it can only play a subset of the uh, MPEG-2 stuff. So for example, they restrict the uh, size. Um, and I, for I forgot to look up the, the Blu-ray, what's the bandwidth rate, right? Uh, that is, did we go through this slide last class? Looks like we went through this stuff, right? And so I think I think I sort of mentioned this. So there's a lot of different profiles and a lot of different sizes. So depending on the, the profile that you have, they, they define what what sizes of video you can send and what the, what's the uh, other parameters. And different different applications use different of those tools, right? Um, so for example, like the the this camcorder over here, is a high definition camcorder, though it uses HDV, right? which is not true 1920 by 1280, 1080. Instead, they use 1440 by 1080, right? And they use a rectangular pixel, meaning the, the pixels on the camcorder is sort of assumed to be rectangular. So even though you only take 1440 by 1080, you rec make it rectangular to fill 1920 by 1080, right? And those, that's that's why they call high 1440, right? So it's not true high definition, but the tape mechanism cannot store data at that at the rate needed for 1920 by 1080. So you you take this stuff and then you do a rectangular stuff. Right? You you treat the pixels rectangular fashion, so you kind of scale it to 1920, right? So you may see this in the the newer if you buy newer high definition TV, um, many of them call it true HD, right? Um, as if the other one is a fake HD. It's not a fake HD, it's a different form of high definition. Um, so the 1440 is essentially what you get on this stuff. And a lot of the times, those are fine. I mean, you, you, it's very hard for you to notice the difference unless you have a really good system and you have a really good way to send this stuff. And most of the times, the, 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 the things are so, so, so many compressions, so many things going on, many times you may not even notice that things are not as you expect it to, to be, right? So the, one of the important things that MPEG-2 had to do was it was supposed to be a broadcast standard, supposed to be sent over the air. So over the air used to, was interlaced, right? Remember the interlaced form where um, you want to send the odd number of lines, the even number of lines in, in different form. So the idea here is you have a, um, you have a 
you, you take the frame, you split them into a number of different lines, and you send the odd ones in one level and even ones in the next level, right? So if you want to use this for MPEG-2, so essentially what you do is you send the odd and then the even in the next iteration, right? That's inter interlaced format. So if you want to do MPEG compression, you can either compress it as the, the progressive format, which is you send all the lines together, and then have the receiver remove it, right? change it to the right fashion. Right? So one way to send that is even though your source is interlaced, you could transmit it as a whole frame. And then on the other receiving end, you can inter deinterlace it. Right? You, can, you can make this interlacing format. Or more likely, you're going to want to transmit it as these interlaced formats. Right? So the way we call that is we call them fields. And one of them is called the top field, another one is called the bottom field, right? So essentially, when you're doing interlacing, you're sending each frame in two different, uh, twice over. So you can call them as a field. So uh, one frame is made up of a top field and a bottom field. Those are the ones which have to be transmitted. So MPEG and MPEG-4 support compression on the fields, not just on the frames, but also on fields, right? Does that make sense? So you, so you have the whole frame. You, for, for, because it's a TV standard, you want it to be sent as interlaced. That means you're going to be, you have to transmit it as the, the odd ones and then as the even ones, right? So MPEG-1 can operate on the level of these fields rather than on the frames where, where you, you want these things to be, right? So why are we discussing this? Would, wouldn't the fields look just like the, the frames. Can you just use the vanilla compression that you do for frames on the fields? Yeah. No, because you wouldn't have, like, if you were looking at a block, it wouldn't be continuous, it would be alternating with, with emptiness. Yeah, it'll either be alternative with emptiness, but you don't, it doesn't have to be empty, right? Um, so what happens is if you have a, like a line like this, right? And let's say the, the interlacing was happening at this level, right? So if you take the, like say this one and this one, right? Right? So if you, without making it empty, if you just squish them together, right? So then it will look kind of jagged, right? Because the other, the, the middle part is on the other field, right? So you'll have more jagged lines on the fields than on the frames, right? Because now you, you're kind of splitting only half of those. So you, unless you do something here, um, you would have had the data points for here, point here. The data point for this one would have been on the other field. So your, your curves would look a lot more jagged on the fields than they do on the frames. Right? Why, why would that be a bad thing? Why would, why, so instead of having a smooth line like this, it'll look like it's, let's say, um, we, we only have these two data points, so you may kind of end up with a straight line or something, right? So you interpret it, yeah. Because it wouldn't be a continuous function anymore, the screen. Yeah, all the, all the compression, we, we love smooth surfaces, right? Because if, this, if it's not smooth, that tends to be the high frequency component. So if you, um, high frequency component is the, is the one that we tend to drop, right? But if you make the image much more high, com high, high frequency than what it has to be, right? So the, the original video was much more smoother. Now you made it into much more high, high frequency. So when you want to compress it aggressively, you can drop the high frequency components, but the image will look a lot worse because you artificially made it higher frequency, and then you're gonna drop all the stuff. So the compression may work, but the image that you get on the other side would, would, would appear much more uh, blocky, right? So, so, the JPEG, so MPEG, they have to treat it separately. So they have to be aware that if it's a field or whether it's a, it's a frame, uh, frames are expected to be much more smoother than the, the fields because of the, of the way these things are transmitted, right? So MPEG-2 and MPEG-4 have to deal with them because it's a broadcast standard, but they have to deal with, with them separately, and that's what we, we look at, right? 
so th they have a number of different ways of uh, of doing this um, um, prediction. You know, so either it can be feel, 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 feel frame. The different variants are 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 in the textbook. It's not important to go through all the all the changes, but um, essentially, you may do the prediction based on the frames or fields. Um, and and the and there's a illustration of what what I just mentioned. So the on the a a part. The frame over there has the, both the odd and the even. But when you're transmitting, you either split the um, the odd number in the top field and the even number into the, the bottom field. So the prediction may happen among the fields or among the frames and or combinations thereof. Right? And it also means that when you do it among the fields, you have much more of the, the, the frequency component becomes much more increased. Right? So the zigzag pattern that you use you were using before would have to become this complex structure. You don't have to remember what the structure is, but it, it changes from the nice zigzag to this weird structure because that sort of compensates for the um, the more jaggedness, right? So you you lose less you lose less components which are more critical because you added them, right? That means you probably get less compression, but at least it won't look awful. So if you just did the field and it compressed it. It looked really bad, but now it, it doesn't look all that bad. But you have to go through this different uh, zigzag pattern. Right? Again, this 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 zigzag pattern tends to look good, but it doesn't look good when you look at it because it's it's not as simple as the zigzag pattern. Right? right? So the the other main important uh, aspect that was introduced here is the notion of a layering, and we'll see this come up in, a lot in in the in in, uh, in the future stuff. Right? One of the things which happen is when you try, when you are transmitting this on the wireless or wired media, like for example in your home and your TV and stuff like that, right? So if it, if a video was encoded at say 10 megabits per second, and if you get 10 megabits per second all the way to your house, then it look the way you wanted it to look, right? But suppose your your home network is lossy, your cable is lossy, your phone is lossy, or, or what have you, right? You tend to lose some of this. So let's say you, your home only has nine megabits per second or eight megabits per second, right? The idea here is I have one video. I would rather not have infinite number of videos where it's tuned for your home is like nine megabits per second. I want to send nine megabits per second. Uh, somebody's eight megabits per second. I want to send eight megabits per second, and so on and so forth. I would like to have one video and sort of send send them in a, such a nice fashion where you you get you you get the quality depending on how much bandwidth you have right so if you have something like 5 megabits per second i would like for you to get half the quality right so if i want to do that right when i just the 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 talking about just ip and b and all those things are not enough to support that kind of a model right because i want to somehow actively say, since you're operating only at half the half the data, right, half the bandwidth, you you ought to be able to somehow get half the. So I, I'm 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 broadcasting, let's say, these streams. I would like to be able to say I'm I'm broadcasting this this four little streams, right? If you only have half the bandwidth, you can sort of. Somehow I say either choose these two or choose any two or whatever, right? So depending on what you're able to get, you get the amount of quality, right? Does that make sense? So the two option is one is I, I take a your 10 megabits per second MPEG2 or, or MPEG4 object, and I can create a 5 megabits per second object, right? Either from the source or from this video, and so when you try to view it, you either view this one or this one, right? Depending on how much bandwidth you have. So if you know that you only have five megabits per second, you you would get to this one or or this one, right? So if I did this, then I would have to have an infinite number of possibilities. Yes, I would have to have what happens if somebody has one megabits per second or, or what have you, right? So that's that's the way that you would do if you didn't do anything specific, interesting. What I would like to do is create, instead of sending one stream, I create multiple streams. One way to do that is layered encoding, which is what we see here. The another one is multiple uh, descriptor coding, which we'll see later on. The idea here is, rather than when I create this content, I don't create this multiple versions, right? I create them this one 10 megabits, let's say, 
into let's say 10 10 little things right so depending on the client side what they have they can get just the um, right amount of stuff and if I do it right which is the challenge in all the stuff then you won't have to figure out which one to get, right? So one of the problems when, I, when I'm talking about was iframes tend to be fairly large and important, right? B frames tend to be not that important and fairly small, right? So if I don't do anything specific, if you just decide to get only the B frame or not get the B frame, you won't get good savings, you won't be able to configure all the stuff, and you won't get qual good quality, right? So the way, the reason here I want to do this is I have this stuff. So if you as a client say, I can, I only have four megabits per second, I should give you, let's say four of this stuff, right? It's not as trivial as it would, uh, as, as you can imagine, but if I can do that, then you should get, um, you, you should, so I, I can be able to help serve everybody, right? So one way to do that is through what is called layered encoding, right? Where we create, we take this video, and we change it into a base layer, and then a bunch of these are called enhancement layers, right? So I, I take the video, split them into multiple enhancement layers, right? So if I do it right, so for example, I can send send this to let's say two Mbps, and let's say this is one and so on, right? So the idea here is, if you only have four, I can send you the base layer and the two enhancement layers, right? Don't think of layers as like sort of like layer, but essentially the idea here is if you add all of this stuff, you get the full quality. But if you only want four megabytes per second, I, I can send you the base and the, the other two layers, right? And that's, that's, that's what we want to do, right? So if you, if, you can, if you can pull this off, then basically I can, I can put you on any, any particular slot, right? So if, if, if all I had was these different variants, Right? So if you have anything less than two megabits per second, you're out of luck. If you have, let's say, two and a half, then I can send you the base layer. And you should, you should if, I, if I do this process right, you should be um, about a you know, quarter happy or, or, or what have you. And then we, we can add the stuff, right? In fact, this, so if you, you, if you have this technology and you mix it with the, the IPTV, Internet uh, uh, Protocol TV, uh, the 88 and stuff, one of the ways they do that is they have multiple multicast channels. You know, from the networking side, if you remember, there's a notion of a multicast, right? Multicast is the set of people who are interested in certain things. So I, if I as a source provider, may create all this in a multicast channel, right? So I can I can send all the stuff. You as a client would have to subscribe to the ones that you you are able to tolerate. So if you're if you only have two megabytes per second, you only listen to the stuff. So your home TV will only be tuned to this particular. Think of this as a, as a channel. You only listen to this channel. And if you have more network, you can tune to the next channel and so on and so forth. Right? So that's the notion of a layered coding. The multiple descriptor coding, which it's not in the textbook, but we'll see uh, later on. The idea there is more of a RAID kind of system, RAID erasure coder kind of system, where it behaves sort of like this. Right? So again, if you do it right, and it's not a trivial task, you can pick any four, any five, rather than here, there, there is a hierarchy. right? So you cannot use enhancement, just like the IP and B and frames, you cannot use the enhancement layer if you don't have the base layer. You need to have the base layer, you need to have the enhancement layers in a certain fashion. With the multiple descriptor coding, the, the, the goal is you can use any, any, whatever you get, and you get good quality. So in the case, if you have 10 of these, if you receive two of them, you should get two out of 10 quality, right? So it doesn't matter, so all of them are completely unrelated. Any two of them should get you as good a quality as you as you can get, right? So these are the two two forms, and we'll see how why this would be useful, right? Can you think of one application for this sort of a technology, uh, like say for in a cell phone? How I many if you have cell phones which can play video or could imagine playing video? This is assuming you all have phones which can play sort of a video, right? Um, and most modern cell phones, let's say, they have Wi-Fi and you know, 3G or 2.5 edge or something, right? Um, th that's how the, sort of the technologies you have, right? So using this technology would be really good because your edge or three, you know, the 3G is not that fast, right? How many of you have edge? Uh, I mean, edge uh, the data services like 3G and, and stuff on your cell phone. How many of you have iPhones or 
this one, one iPhone, right? How many of you have seen the, the Google phone? Right? So if you believe the hype, right? I mean, the future is all these phones are going to go video, all the, all the phones are going to do all this, uh, all this stuff, right? So in that model, right, 3G itself cannot service the, the kind of bandwidth that you can probably get from your Wi-Fi, right? So if you're near a Wi-Fi station, I would have more bandwidth, right? So I don't want my AT&T or whoever provider to, to, be, to only say, you know, make the video only at the quality that is possible with the 3G, which is not all that good, which is not all that high, right? So if I could do something like this, then when you're out in the middle of the road and all you have is a 3G, um, your video is acceptable. In this case, you will only maybe get the base layer. In this case, maybe you get one or two layers. But as you, if so if you walk over to the to the campus and you have Wi-Fi, then you you may still use the the base layer through the uh, through the 3G, and then have the additional layers come in through another channel through your Wi-Fi or something, right? So it looks seamlessly when you when you walk through the campus, you suddenly get better quality. It won't drop because your base layer is still coming through the 3G, and then when you go off the campus your quality will lose, but your video will be coming through, depending on what network you have, right? So that's the holy grail, because there's, it's not possible, or, or it's not cost effective for them to give you really high uh, bandwidth to your phone yet, but if you can do all this stuff, it's nice. So the layering and, and, the, and the MDCs are, are very, very important, right? It's not probably important for, for DVD, because your DVD player can only play uh, whatever bandwidth it wants. So that's the notion of, um, layered coding or, or scalable coding, which is what the, the book talks about. They go through a number of different mechanisms on how you can do this stuff, right? Again, the goal here is you want to be able to separate them into things. And at least in this case, this base layer is an independent layer, right? You can get the base layer and you should be able to decode them. Base layer plus enhanced, the enhanced layer is not independent, but adding together, they will become They'll add, to, I mean, you know, if you add these two layers, right, you will get a, qual a video which is of higher quality, right? So this goes beyond what the IP and B frames. So if you want to think of this as IP and uh, B frames, you may think of this as you need to have the I frame at this level, right? So you may have more P or B frames at this level, but it's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? So they, they does it make sense? It's a very important technology. It's not explored that much in this paper because this is far, far newer. The example I was giving you, the, the two examples of cell phones and IPTV and all, were not popular when the book was written, right? It, the book was written in 2003, which in, 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 the, in the standards and uh, uh, the video world was eons back, right? Um, so it's not there, but it's a very important technology. We'll see how, how, how that applies in, in the stuff, right? So, <laughs> thanks. Yeah, so, so that's the notion of the, uh, of the scalable uh, coding. And when they were initially starting it, it was, it was meant more as uh, uh, what happens when the network link goes down, right? So I remember the, watching the TV from my home, and you would sort of connect to these different layers is what, uh, what they were uh, thought of this stuff. Right. Um, it, the, the, it supports a whole range of scalabilities, and again, the, the details are in the paper, I'm sorry, in the, in the book, but the important thing to remember is each one of them is trying to achieve the goal of keeping this simple like this, right? And as you can imagine from all these technologies, it's, with the multimedia, it's never like simple like this. You, you never say, I want to give one megabits per second for base layer, two megabits per second for enhanced med layer and stuff, right? Why is that? Why, why, why couldn't I just say I want to give two megabytes per second for base layer and expect sort of a good good quality video? Why do I have to have all the stuff kind of squishy and stuff, right? The, the answer depends on the um, what does the compression ratio depend on? Or how much compression you can get, depend, what does it depend on? Yeah. The actual content of the video. Yeah, the actual content of the video, right? And, and that's, that's the one that we don't have any control over, right? The content of the video drives all the stuff, right? 
Um, so depending on the content, particular content, you may get good quality or, or bad quality. Um, and we have, we have really no control over it, right? Um, so one of the things that I think will happen in the future is a lot of the, lot of the movie, movie producers, right? Movies are taken in a 24 progressive, right? It only shows 24 frames, right? Whereas TV is at 30 frames per second. If you do the, third, you know, the, the full progressive, is 30 frames per second, right? Your computer monitor usually is like 60, 60 or 80 progressive, right? So the you know, so if you if you put your computer monitor in 24 uh, progressive, right, 24 frames uh, refresh, right, you'll notice the thing being like flickery, right, because it's 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 not meant for it, right, because you have lots of little characters and lots of stuff that you sort of use it because you you expect to have a good frame rate, right. So when the movie movie uh, uh, directors take the take the movies. They know that the frame rate is there, right? Maybe they don't call it frame rate, but they know that the, the certain things happen, right? So when they take the picture, they make sure that they don't take the movie in a fashion where you notice the frame rate, right? You may have noticed it when you do take your own own uh, movie camera, right? So one of the things that amateurs or people at, at home do is they take a video like this, right? They they want to take a picture of this room, so they take the picture and go like this, right? You know what I'm, what, I, what I'm doing? I'm, I'm just taking it, like, let's say this is the lens, right? I'm going through like this, right? What that means is I'm moving so fast that your one frame may point here, another frame may point here, another frame may point here. The, the frames are so far apart, you notice that there's a lot of extrapolation. Then you notice lots of, um, you get a headache, right? So if, if you might have seen some of your family videos where you watch for a little bit, you get a headache because there's like so much of uh, scene changing, right? So when the when the when the movie movie directors take the picture, they are aware of this, so they never move it faster than what the the technology can do because they they want the stuff to appear uh, smoother, right? So the the idea here is as the as as more of the production is going towards digital, as more of the directors are aware that things are going to be projected on the digital in a certain in a 30, 30 or, or or what have you, they're going to take at least the movies and at least the TVs and stuff, they're going to be aware of how these things are going to proceed. So hopefully they'll, they'll create videos which work better than um, if they do it in a poor fashion, right? There's some, some movies which you, you look at the movie where they, there's so much action, right? You know it's going to compare, uh, encode really poorly, right? So how many of you watch the movie like Transformers? The newer one, right? If you watch the movie, right, there's so much action going on, right? But forget about what the, the movie, the storyline action, but if you look at this, this frame, right, if you, if you try to go at frame by frame, right, between each frame there's so much of movement, right? Um, maybe it adds something to the storyline, but from the compression perspective, that's sort of the worst thing you can do, right? Because you're, you're, you're completely removing all kind of temporal redundancy, right? So it's gonna compress so poorly all these things are going to go really crazy because it's, 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 it goes against what, what these things are supposed to do, right? Um, but other than that, from a compression perspective, there's not much we can do because if you want to compress, for example, the Transformers kind of scene, the quality would be so, so poor because it's the, the scene is changing a lot, right? Um, and that's one of the things that you have to grapple with. I mean, you, you would like these things to say, I have two megabits per second bandwidth, so I need to be able to do this kind of stuff, but this, that's never true. And you may have noticed it even in the, in, when you're watching TV. If you're watching TV um, and you're not, you don't have like the best signal in the world, right? Things will be fine till things start to change a lot, right? So if you see advertisement, they, they try to cram in as many pictures as possible, so you, your pictures get all pixelated. Um, and again, that depends on the scene, and there's not a whole lot we can do, but in general, you can, you can try, right? And there are, there are other stuff that MPEG, MPEG2 adds, you know, this is a more modern format. Uh, so for example, if it supports the, you know, four is to two is to two, which adds a lot more color, four is to four is to four, which does no color downsampling, right? Um, and it, it restricts the slice structure because it, so uh, turns out using slices are, are fairly hard. So you don't need all the power of uh, slices that you can get with MPEG-1, right? Remember the slices, I can select a bunch of blocks as part of a, a slice and then have their own quantization table. It restricts them because it's not that, uh, it's not used that much, right? Um, 
it, it supports a whole range of stuff. So the the vanilla HDTV that you you get off the air is encoded using MPEG two. Right. The the other thing it supports it it supports nonlinear quantization. So you can have a quantization. You can have a lookup table. Right. So this means that you can you if you set up this table. So the I quantization table, the scaling factor is over here. So if you do it right, for example, if you have a newscaster, right? Uh, this is one of the typical examples you have, right? So the, suppose this is a scene of a newscaster, and suppose you know that newscaster is going to be like this all the time, right? And where this is a, some insert video, and this is the person sitting. And you have some sort of a background in the, in, the, in the back, right? So what I would like to do is, instead of not just specifying like slices and stuff, have a quantization table where the, you know, this part of the screen has higher quality, this part has higher quality, this part has lower quality. The way to do that is I kind of create the, the, a table which states that you know, if you choose this macro block, use, uh, use, the, use the particular scale, which scales the quantization matrix, which figures out how much quality loss you say. So that's an easy way to kind of encode the stuff. So if you're a TV, TV station, you, you do this every day, then you set up this table so I can get different quality. So the, 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 the scene will look really good, even though you're, you're directing more of a quality here, right? So it's, it's, it's the cheap version of doing the slices. I don't have to do the slices. I just use the different quantization scale on the same image, right? I give this example because a lot of research uses the the uh, the, the TV newscaster is, is one of the things where they can do a whole lot of stuff because things rarely move because the camera is stationary and they do this over and over again so they can kind of do all these tricks. It's a lot harder to do it on a on a random scene, right? And, and we can do this, for example, in this class too, so because we can set up the uh, the parameters of how far I move and and set up the quantization table for the different end, end components, right? So we didn't actually add any new new techniques so far. We're just enhancing the stuff because some of the things which seem to work are, are, are made better. So we, we take it to the next step, which is MPEG-4, which is the, the, cur the current standard. It was actually standardized around 2003, right when the book was published, right? Um, MPEG-4 is, was, was it, it's, the, it's, a, it's the format that um, Apple iTunes uses for, for its video and stuff. A lot of, lot of the newer vendors are pushing it. Like I mentioned before, Blu-ray continues to use MPEG-2, but it, I think it also can play MPEG-4, right? Um, some of your newer hard disk-based camcorder, hard disk-based high definition camcorders, they use MPEG-4, right? I think they call it ABC HD, right? Advanced Video. Um, I think Advanced Video Coding, right? If I forget what the uh, acronym is. So ABC HD uses MPEG-4 for encoding, right? MPEG-4 itself is lot, can do a lot of stuff, which I'm not really sure how many of the encoders can actually use. So I'm going to start with one particular component of MPEG-4, which is the H.264, uh, which, which, uh, which is the standard, which sort of follows around the line of H.261, H.262 um, that we sort of looked at uh, earlier, right? Um, and, and then look at MPEG-4, which which can do objects, which which is a lot more harder to do, right? So okay, again, M H so we we use you probably see all the content from Apple in the H.264 format. It's the compression algorithm, right? Which is part of the MPEG standard because this is a compression algorithm, and MPEG is the the transport or how the video is sent, right? It's a better compression algorithm. It, it gives you more 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 compression, like what you would expect. It achieves that through a number of mechanisms, right? So one of the mechanisms is it uses a different um, entropy coding, right? Which which tends to be more computationally uh, uh, um, intensive, but it gives you better uh, uh, compression. Um, the the unified and the CA VLC. We don't have to go through those algorithms to see what they're exactly doing, but remember the the the, the quantization stuff and the entropy coding at the at the end, right? So these these algorithms provide a different entropy coding, right? They don't change the way you have to do the quantization. So remember, you take the image, uh, you can convert them into a, a domain where things can be dropped. You do the quantization, and then the entropy coding, you do a better job, right? Um, and you can you can kind of, kind of see even for the LCW, um, you you notice that you don't catch all the redundancies, and these ones capture more redundancy. 
Um, the other thing they found was if you do it, so when you do motion prediction, right? Remember, you you have two frames, right? You you you, you um, in the vanilla one, from one frame to another frame, you figure out where the object should be, right? So you, you create the motion vector, and then you do the difference between the the take this image, apply the motion vector, and get the predicted frame. Then you difference between the predicted frame and the actual frame, and the difference vector you want to transmit it to the other side, right? And in the examples, you notice that the the difference matrix, it's not all does not have to be, you know, fully in the in the in the uh, the same size as this one. Because if you do a good job, most of them should be uh, black or, or no change, right? So if, if the object were to move here, you expect some differences over here. You expect the rest of them to 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 vanish, right? So they use that. To change the size of the matrix, not just to keep it at the 16 by 16. Now you can have smaller sizes. So if you notice this, what what happened? Then I can choose the diff the encode the difference as a smaller matrix, which only captures what happened. Does that make sense? Right. I take the frame. The, this is the original previous frame. This is the current frame. Right. So I did the motion prediction. And the motion prediction said the, the object should be over here, right? But the actual case was somewhere here. So you do the differencing, right? And the difference is what you entropy encode and transmit. But if the entropy encoding does not need to deal with the whole matrix, I can choose a smaller matrix to represent that stuff, right? And that's what they try to do. So they can go all the way from 4 by 4 to 16 by 16. And again, it depends on the whether it's the chroma or lumina, right? Lumina fits 16 by 16. On the chroma, it'll be 8 by 8, because you do a 4, 4 is to 2 is to 0. And so when you go from 16 by 16 to 8 by 8, it becomes 4 by 4 on the, one is the lumina, one is the chroma, depending on the subsampling, right? So again, again, these, these things tend to, um, Tend, tend to give you more saving because you know if you if you're doing a good job. So if you're doing a good job of motion prediction, this will help you. If you're not going to doing a good job of motion prediction, then you're going to see a whole bunch of changes. So now it gives you a flexibility of not just being forced to a 16 by 16, but much smaller, right? And again, these are uh, in square terms. So 15, 16 by 16 to 4 by 4, you lose, um, you you save exponentially, right? Um, so again, it 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 it, it for the it does intra prediction, right? Within a single iframe, there's nothing before. We could, so within a single iframe, I can have one block predict the other block, right? So if I'm looking at, at, at a scene which is very predictable, or if there's not much change, right? So think of this as I can do a much more aggressive compression on the iframe itself, right? It's still an independent, independently coded one. It still has to be sent on the other way, other side as it is. But it, there's a lot of prediction going on within itself. So it can achieve, so if the scene doesn't change all that much, your iframe does not have to be as big because it's it's much more aggressive form of coding. right? So you can think of this as a more aggressive form of JPEG within the iframe, and, and, and they will use that. So one of the things they do is they make the iframe smaller, and they make the the motion prediction frames smaller because now you don't have to send, you may choose the, the size of the motion compensation uh, vector, right? Um, since they tend, since if you do a good job of, of both those, there's not a whole lot you, uh, redundancy you see, right? So in, in, the, in the example here, if I didn't choose a smaller matrix, I had lots of zeros, but just by the fact that I chose a bigger matrix, right? Now if I chose a smaller matrix, I'm not going to see as much zeros over here because I already do a good job of only choosing the stuff that I, I, I needed, right? So again, the same case, if I do the iframe, if I find out that what I'm looking at is a, so let's say a blank piece of wall, so I can send one macro block within the iframe and then say all of other, other things are predicted from that single stuff, right? So my iframe is going to be smaller because it's, it's figuring out all the redundancies within a single spatial iframe. My P frame is going to be better because I'm I'm choosing all the stuff. So if I'm doing both of those stuff, then I don't have to be really good at the 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 
the uh, the quantization stuff because you know I'm already doing a good job. So in the MPEG-4, in the H.264, they are less aggressive because you do a good job upfront on the uh, on the other stuff, right? Overall, you win because um, overall you get better compression, um, and other details are in the paper, and it's it's, it's you know you can you can uh, look at it. So the, there are a number of different profiles. The two profiles that are interesting is the baseline and the and the main, right? Which is sort of what what is implemented in many uh, encoders. So the, in the case of baseline, um, which is uh, which is used for video conferencing kind of systems, they they introduce three different uh, technologies, right? The last one is the redundant slices. So now I I still have the notion of slices, but I can send the slice over and over again. So if you're uh, uh, twice, if I have more bandwidth and you're doing a video chat, even if you lose some packets, I can send the slice over again. And the system can decode the second slice and then overlay on top of the previous one to get to get uh, good quality, right? The, 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 um, the the first one the the arbitrary slice order. So now I have a slice. Right? Let, let's say I I create a slice which is across all the stuff. I don't have to send them in a raster fashion like here, right? I can send them all independently in some order, right? The slices can be decoded at any part that you want, which means that if there's a signal loss and I lost this particular frame, I could still continue to to process the the next one or if the, the packets were reordered and I got the packets for here first because of the network conditions, right? This ability lets me show what I got, right? So the, the video doesn't look all that choppy because even if we're doing a video conferencing, uh, even if I chose all this to be a slice, and suppose I lost this stuff but I, I, I got the something else, I don't have to wait for all these things to come in order. I can show whatever I have. And it, in general, it looks good, uh, especially in the things. Um, and again, the macro blocks can be uh, decoded whenever they, they, they're not dependent on each other. So if you've seen the, um, depending on the older cable, if you lose something, you may see like a long gray bar going across because it, it lasts the whole macro block uh, decoding. Whereas here, you only see like uh, the squares of wherever you, you lost it, right? Not the, the error recovery is much better, right? And again, this is a way of like how you encode the data, not necessarily changing the algorithm, but the way you, you're transmitting the stuff. Um, so it, in general, you get better quality for, uh, for uh, encoding. Um, so there, there's a lot more changes on the, on the B frame, right? So uh, on the, um, this is the main profile. This is the, the stuff that, for example, this, this lecture I encoded using H.264 main profile. Um, so it's for broadcasting a stored medium, so you, know, you can download the video. Um, they introduce a lot of stuff because you know, B-frames tend to be uh, useful. So you can use the B-frames uh, to predict future frames, right? In the, in the, in the, H, in the MPEG-1, um, you, can, you have to predict forward. You can predict a B-frame from a P-frame, but you can't use a B-frame as a reference frame, right? Reference frame has to be I or a P-frame. So here you can use a B-frame as a, as a reference frame. Right? So which means that you can have two B frames predicting another B frame, right? And which is sort of recursively. I mean, the first B frame has to depend, to depend on I frame, but then the subsequent B frames can depend on other B frames or P frames, right? Um, they, there are a lot of other enhancements. So B frame does not have to be forward and backward like what you had in the stuff before. The two predicting frames can be anywhere, right? So the two predicting frames can be in the future. The two predicting frames can be in the past, right? In fact, you can go up to 16 reference frames. So where each B frame can be predicted by up to 16 different frames or 32 different fields, right? Um, again, these are capabilities that your decoder can, can use doesn't mean that the encoder has to use because that means you need to use that many frames to operate on to figure out what the frame is. So to, to encode this, if to use this feature, I need to look at, let's say I use the 16 reference frames. I need to look at 16 reference frames and figure out which one of them would by predict my B frame, right? So the compression is going to be a lot more complicated, but the decompression could be, uh, it, this is time would allow you to do all, uh, all the stuff. Um, and so one of the things is the if you look at the Wikipedia article for on this one, um, 
again, the key here is they, they tell you all the stuff which is supported by the different encoders, right? So the, um, on the top, you have the different um, play like you know, QuickTime and all the different uh, uh, decoders. And the, uh, you have the different capabilities, right? So for example, some of the I'm, I'm talking about like you know, flexible macro block ordering, right? None of them support it except the vSoft one, right? So that's that's the the uh, so the profiles help you because the profiles tell you what is possible, what is what is reasonable way to assume, right? So you could have an MPEG4 decoder which is standards compliant, yet not know how to deal with S, SI and SP slices. Um, there are others that. There's a whole bunch of red, so you know. So the, for example, the, the 4 is to 4 is to 4 uh, chroma for format, right? Even though the standard supports it, very few decoders would know how to deal with it, right? Or 4 is to 2 is to 2, um, and so on and so forth, right? Um, so again, that's 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 the that's the reality of, of these things, um, and we're kind of out of time. But um, essentially, this is the H.264. And the next lecture, I would like to finish with the MPEG-4 standard, which is which defines a whole lot of stuff which may or may not be possible, right? So I'll see you on Wednesday. <laughs>